Hello. All right, I think we can get started. <clears throat> so this is contributing to OpenStack 201 for the not so new contributor. I'm Scott D'Angelo, this is Andrea Rosa. Um, what we're gonna do is kind of share some of our experiences as we move from being simple bug fixers and doing just a review here and there to get more involved in complex features, um, what it takes to really drive things in, in OpenStack. Uh, we also did a bit of a survey. We asked some people, a lot of core developers and, and a couple of former PTLs and some other folks at about our level, just some advice, things that were perhaps annoying, um, the effect and influence on of people's names, people's reputations. So we'll share some of that with you throughout this presentation. Welcome, everyone. Just a brief introduction of ourselves. I'm an Andrea Rosa, software engineer at HP. I work on the uh, Bristol Nova team. I'm a middle-class OpenStack citizen since Diablo release. I work on HP Public Cloud, then I moved to the new project, Helion OpenStack, which is a cloud solution based, of course, on OpenStack. You can find my details here. And I'm Scott D'Angelo. I'm also with HP. I uh, work mostly on Cinder and some Cinder Nova interactions. Um, also started with the public cloud and, and continue on with Helion, and I'm Scott D.A. on IRC. So we define ourselves as mid-class OpenStack citizen. What that means? <laughs> don't get me wrong, it's nothing to do with social classes. Uh, uh, we don't want to give any bad connotation to this term. It's just a name, a name which I found when we were working on uh, this presentation. I'll try to explain what we mean by this term. So, if you see the OpenStack community, we have three kinds of contributors. We have newbie, so people just join the community. The community is welcome, it's very welcome for new contributors. They need to understand how the things work, they need to understand the processes, how to set up Garrett correctly. It's likely that the first contribution is about an easy bug fix. Then we have Rockstar. So Rockstar people who knows everything. They know the code, they know the processes, they know the workflows, they have amazing statistics in stack analytics. And between these two categories, we have the middle class citizen. Yeah, so, so this is where we found ourselves. You know, our employers asked us, hey, we want, we want this feature in. We need to start driving things uh, in OpenStack. Uh, so things get more complex. You have to start writing blueprints and specs. Um, you have to know how things work well enough to even know if this feature is going to get in. You have to start using some influence with people to get them to even look at your patch. Um, and so we felt like there was a bit of a gap between you know the the, the welcoming for the new person and all the uh, things that you'll find in the documentation about submitting your first patch. And of course, people who already know all this, we had to kind of struggle. So we, that's kind of what this presentation evolved from is our experiences. So uh, one thing we did was we asked people, you know, what, what advice would you give? Um, we asked, you know, what things annoy you? And we asked about the influence uh, uh, that people's reputation has when you look at a patch and you see the name of the submitter. How does that affect your thinking? So that's, that's uh, the survey that we sent out. So it's all about sharing. We want to talk about good things, but uh, even we want to talk about what we don't like or things that we think they are not really good. So what we don't want is to get banned by the community, however, <laughs> this talk. Yeah, so, and some of it is about sharing the pain. If you haven't been through 50 patch sets uh, of, of trying to get a fix in and then you get a minus one at, uh, on patch set 51, uh, you, you, you don't know the pain. So uh, I think everybody goes through that at some point as, as things get more complex. And you know, some of it is just about saying, you're not alone, this, this happens to everyone, including experienced people and, and, and core reviewers. And finally, we know that technology doesn't give hug, but we do. So at the end of the presentation, <laughs> if you want, we are here and give away free hugs. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> so 
so OpenStack is a big community. Uh, you know, it's a lot like a traffic jam. There's, there's, people are helpful, people are encouraging, but, but people are busy. So in order to get things done, you kind of have to be as efficient as, as possible because you have to have this understanding that everybody is, has a completely full schedule. Uh, so there's certain things that you can do to, to, to speed things up, and there's certain things that happen that, that slow things down. So the first thing is a bad review. Uh, we, I'm not talking about uh, uh, minus one because your bet has some issues. You need to add some consent. That's how it's supposed to do, right? The, the, the review process is supposed to be used for these things. But we identify some minus one, which we think they are annoying minus one, and we think we should avoid to give this minus one because they are uh, a problem. They really slow down the process, which is already a long process. I will give you some example later. So the other thing that slows down the process is, is you, the submitter. Um, I do this, you know, I'll, 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 I'll write some code, I'll work through it, I'll get the batch ready, it's getting to be the end of the day, and then I hastily, you know, push it with Git review, but I didn't think about the unit test or I didn't think about the commit message, and uh, by not being thorough, you know, it pushes the whole process back, and you get a bunch of minus ones, so, you know, the, part of the encouragement is just to think proactively about all the problems that you're going to cause and, and, and avoid the things that you know are going to give you minus ones or, or cause issues. Third factor, code reviewers. This is one of the risky things to say, uh, but it's a reality, right? They are at the end of the process. They are the people with the power. They can say, yes, this patch is good, can land, or say, no, no way, this patch is not going to land. And uh, so try to understand who are code reviewers. Someone say, code reviewers are the new unicorn. They live in a secret land. And uh, we know for sure that they are responsible for the dinosaur extinctions. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> we won't demyth the myth. Uh, we think they are normal people, um, very capable, uh, with uh, a single big problem, time. They need time. They need to do reviews, coding, stay on IRC, following a mailing thread. And they are usually a small group. I talk about Nova especially, I think it's too small, right? Um, one easy solution is to make uh, the group uh, bigger. Uh, but I understand it's a matter of balance between the number of people and th th they need basically to uh, be on the same page, right? So it's difficult. Uh, but simply, they don't have time. They can't cope with the high demand request of reviews coming from the community. There are even other solutions. Yeah, so uh, this is discussed, and there's summit sessions about how to scale the teams. And um, Neutron has created a system of lieutenants who have the power to pr promote core reviewers and, and delegate things. Um, I don't know that we have any great answers there, um, but that is what the biggest problem you know we see is that the bandwidth of the core reviewers is limited and uh, at the end of the day we, we you know we're struggling for their attention as people who aren't core reviewers we 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 sort of need their approval so um, some of the some of the options have been discussed but uh, nobody's really solved this problem yet this is the first advice we want to share with you we got this advice from and the survey uh, basically say, be prepared to stand up for your uh, decision. So when you submit a patch, and uh, remember, if you got a minus one, it's not the end of the world. And remember, they are not always right. This is true for core reviewers, but for any reviewers in general. If you can clearly explain what your patch does, if you can prove that this is an improvement for the project, or you are fixing a very nasty bug, I've seen in the past uh, core reviewer change their mind from a minus one to plus two. And yes, there's another thing to say about this. Um, if you have some concern, well, try to, to be, to be open-minded and prepare to listen to the, to the reviewer and try to address concern as well. Uh, the second thing, this is annoying, uh, an annoying thing reported. Uh, it, it's all about respect the other person. So sometimes you can have uh, a really Rude review. To be honest, it's not uh, very common. Uh, just let you know uh, to know that if this happens, you can report this uh, to to the community. And again, if you are on the other side of the fence, don't be rude, but try to 
explain uh, your concern and try to give suggestion to the person. So, so one of our respondents, uh, when asked what was annoying, had a great thing to say. You know, he said, nothing is annoying. It's really an opportunity to teach and to learn. Um, and so that, you know, I not only found that very, very welcoming and nice, but I also thought that was a good thing for, for us to do is, you know, to kind of reach out to people when they ask questions on IRC and, uh, you know, help them. And instead of seeing some of this sort of negative reaction that sometimes you'll see where people say, you know, read the manual or this or that, see it as a chance to help someone along. So, I, you know, this was a, a former PTL and a, and, a, and a fairly prominent citizen who responded this way, and I thought that was... That was really great to see. So we saw this over and over and over again in, in the survey. Bad commit messages or a commit message that doesn't do a very good job of explaining the, pat, the patch's purpose. You know, it's the first thing people see when they're reviewing. Uh, for me, it's the last thing I write when I'm submitting a patch. So there's a little disconnect there because uh, I don't put the effort into the, to the commit message that I'm putting into the code, which I've learned to stop that practice. So there was a thread in the mailing list. I don't know if you saw this where the, the complaint was <laughs> if the commit message is you know, over 72 characters minus one. And the thread went on for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And is this something you, you, you should do or you must do? Um, but it kind of shows how silly things can get. You know, It's like, am I looking at this on my phone? Why can't it be more than 72 characters? But but, but the truth is, it's supposed to be less than 72 characters. So rather than argue about it, I mean, at least know the rules and, and think ahead when you're submitting your patch because it's, it's somebody's going to see it immediately and tag it. By the way, I think it's still on this discussion. I, it's still going on. <laughs> uh, another thing is, uh, that was annoying was that the commit message doesn't explain the patch. You know, the, as a developer, you'll look at Git log and you'll see you know, what the patch was all about. I mean, the commit message ends up being the documentation for the patch. So if it's just sort of a brief thing, um, that doesn't necessarily get you minus one, but it doesn't endear you to the community. And, and I, you do see lots of things rejected because of issues in the commit message when you know it's really just documentation. So do a good job, I guess, is the, is the end result of you know, people complaining about this. One more thing about commit message. Uh, maybe you already know, um, if you are your change is uh, implementing a specs or a blueprint. Uh, it's required to have a reference to the blueprint. Uh, if, you are, if it's a bug fixing, again, there is a requirement to put a reference to the bug. Uh, but do not expect the viewer to go and open the bug description or open the specs and uh, read uh, through all the description. All the relevant information a reviewer needs to get the context of the page must be on the commit message. Oh, the, f the fix for this annoying is quite simple. Just we have guidelines, uh, read them, use them. We have put uh, a link here just in case if you need. So while reviewing, I, I, I found uh, <coughs> one thing I was reviewing that just kind of stood out. The author uh, gives examples. He starts talking about you know what the patch does in the commit message and uh, he goes on and uh, gives a bit of the code, and, and it, it, it's quite a bit. But you know, when you when you read it, and when you're when it's preparing you to review the code, it really sets a nice tone. Um, he found a SQL alchemy bug that he references, so that you don't you know get caught up in that snafu. And then, of course, he adds his uh, his bugs and his specs and his blueprints. It seems like a lot, but when you're actually reviewing the code, it's a real pleasure you know to to, to see that. So you know. Everybody likes to review his code, and he gets a lot of attention. And he actually became a core reviewer last uh, last release. And right. I'll try to use this. Thing. Okay, you work on. It. Uh, well, this is a kind of gentle reminder. We all know how important tests are, about this guy. And uh, so, yeah, good. And uh, the rule is simple: new future, you must have unit test. Ah, okay, so. Uh, test everything. Um, as regards the functional test, uh, probably they are not so mandatory, and probably it really depends on your change. But if you can write a functional test as well, it's nice things to have. Okay, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you you may have seen this or encountered this, but it's pretty easy. No unit tests. You know, you get the minus one immediately. Um, 
So once again, it's one of those things where if you, you, you should plan ahead, maybe write the test first um, because you're going to write the test sooner or later. Um, another thing too is your test will fail Jenkins or your patch will fail Jenkins if it doesn't pass, you know, Toxin PEP 8. And you can run it on your workstation, but I, I, I can't count how many patches I see up there for review and then it fails and you look at why it failed and it was, you know, a hanging indent problem or lines don't differentiate. And some of those problems to solve I found difficult, but there actually are tools like Auto PEP 8, Vim plugins. I think Emacs probably has a plugin that will fix it for you and it'll tell you what to do because I don't know about you, but I've had the hanging indent one where you'd like subtract the character, it still doesn't work, subtract the character. You know, you, it, it seems impossible to fix, but uh, there are tools out there, so. so yeah, now I have an amazing animation here. So. Oh. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. As we got back to fixing. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Um, we still think 99% of the time uh, you have to write unit tests for bug fixing. So we have designed this uh, workflow. Bug fixing, write a red test. So write uh, a failing test. Uh, you can copy your test maybe uh, and put in the bug description. Uh, fix the code, make the test pass. And if, if you've done it, yeah, job done, great job. We think this simple uh, uh, workflow uh, can make uh, the reviewer's life easier, that means maybe your pets uh, uh, will, will land uh, uh, sooner. And we call this test-driven development. Mm. <laughs> so you heard it first here. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation we want to talk about uh, annoying minus one. And uh, so we think uh, that probably some people think that there is always a reason to give a minus one. So if I open a uh, a snippet of code now, I'm sure we can find something we don't like, right? I'm 100% sure. But that doesn't mean it's a good reason to give a minus one. Yeah, so in this advice, I mean, you can't really do things about other people's reviewing and knitting um, and getting on you for a typo or something, but as reviewers, we can kind of make sure we don't do this. Um, one of the things we started doing in Cinder is encouraging people not to give a minus one for a typo or something that doesn't affect the code. Just say, hey, next patch set, you know, if you upload another one, please fix it. Otherwise, the code looks good. You can give a plus one even if there's a, a typo in the code. Or you can give a zero if you don't want to give it a plus one. But the thing about minus ones is it flags it to everyone else and everyone will not touch that code until the minus one is removed. And so you've got to go through another patch set for some little typo or you've got an extra space there. Um, it's a cultural change we're trying to do. I don't know how well we can affect all the services, but um, it's really pleasant to have gone a few few iterations of this and gotten to the point where people who do knit on a, my, on a, on a typo or an error, they kind of get chastised. So it's, it's, it's starting to work. Yes, don't forget the power of zero. You can give a zero. <laughs> yes. uh, I really like the idea of Cinder community to not give a minus one for a typo, and uh, especially for not native English speaker like myself. So we all speak English, uh, more or less. Scott speaks uh, slightly better English than mine. Um, but don't forget, we are an international community, right? So um, I, I'm not saying it's not good to give a minus one for a grammar mistakes. I'm just saying. Uh, if you get a minus one on set number 25 because uh, the grammar is not correct in a comment in your code, it's a bit annoying, right? So, yes, please bear with people like me who don't speak English very well. And one more thing, this is a thing that happened to me about to use conventional English. So I got a review from my colleague, uh, one colleague, and uh, he put a line, uh, um, say something, uh, uh, this is super fish oil. Well, it took... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not joking. Was it you? <laughs> it took 20 minutes uh, to me to try to understand what actually he meant. <laughs> and they gave up. And so I walked to his desk and said, sorry, can you explain? And apparently, it seems that if you read super fish oil quickly, it sounds like superficial. <laughs> wow. He was obvious to him. He wasn't to me at all. So, yeah, super fish oil is not superficial. So, one more time, please use conventional English. We are an international community. 
Uh, this was one of the things, both given as advice and pointed out as annoying, is people who don't read the history of the patch. I was just talking with a core reviewer who was pretty angry today because he had flagged something. Don't you know? Don't do this. You've got to remove this parameter. And then uh, several patch sets later, the parameter came back, and someone approved it, and the code got merged in. So um, reading the history of the patch is important for a lot of reasons. But when you jump in as a reviewer, it's good to read the history of the patch because then you'll know why things were addressed the way they are, and you'll avoid that, that kind of mistake. Uh, it can be tedious to do, but it's one of the things that uh, came back in our survey several times. Um, so one thing that, that kind of worked for me, and it was given out by, by someone as advice, I wanted to get more involved. I wanted to do more work upstream. Um, so the thing to do is to find out what work is needed. There's certain areas, I think, that are either sexy or that they're very important to your employer and everybody else is doing the same kind of work because you're all storage vendors, for example, in Cinder. And then there's certain areas that are neglected. Um, so I found myself kind of asking around what needs to be done, what's neglected. Um, because Cinder is pretty tightly coupled with Nova, there's a, there's a whole lot of interactions with the, the way volumes are managed with Nova and Cinder. And nobody was really working on it. So I started in on it, started working on bugs, started learning about it. It just opened up more and more things that needed doing. Um, and now I have more work than I know what to do with. But it is, it's all very welcome work. So I think the, the key takeaway from this person's advice is that you'll be encouraged and welcomed and helped more if you find some point of pain in the project uh, that's neglected. And the way to do that is, is just to ask. Go to the PTL. And I've seen in, in IRC several people say, hey, I'm, I want to get started. What can I do? And the PTL will say, here's something that needs doing, and, and kind of point them in that direction. So some, a simple way to get involved and to, to get involved in more complex things. You can decide to play some uh, strategy to try to get attention from uh, reviewers. Uh, we have analyzed some of these strategies, uh, and we think actually they don't work. Uh, so we call these silly strategies. I'll give you some example. Uh, that's interesting. The, um, a Swift core reviewer uh, told me that they have found sometimes people prefer to give uh, a safe plus one after uh, an, uh, a plus two from a core reviewer, uh, which is fine. It can happen, right? But uh, if this become becomes a habit, uh, probably the how to say uh, probably this is not going to help in growing your credibility inside uh, the community. Uh, the other things, this is funny. Uh, if you if you put a typo on the commit message, uh, you know uh, the title of uh, the commit message appears on IRC. So if you have a typo, probably you get an immediate minus one. That means immediate attention from reviewers. Again, it's a strategy which works, but well, it's not very helpful. Yeah. Uh, so another complaint that I've uh, that I've heard people say is that the obsession with stackalytics for for people that well, you know, you're not a core reviewer, but you 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 have aspirations, and if you look at stackalytics, you can see your number of reviews and and how do you rank next to your peer and 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 what's your ratio of minus ones to plus ones because you know those minus ones are valued and that's why we knit and get my you know an easy minus one I get to give a minus one. Um, but when you really talk to people, you know, the core reviewers are doing lots of reviews, so they see your reviews and they know whether you're given a good review and you're really very thorough and giving minus ones because you find flaws in the code. And they also know if you're the guy who's racked up a lot of minus ones because you, you're the one who catch all the, the typos. Um, so I don't think you're really fooling anyone. And, and, and everyone I talk to sort of knows that and acknowledges that when they're, you know, at the core level. So I guess the advice there is to uh, not obsess over Stackalytics too much. I, I only check it like three times a day. That's my rule. Uh, you know, just the advice we saw over and over again is review, review, review. Um, you want to be reviewed. That's how you're going to get your stuff in. But then again, you, you need to review to not only to show you're participating, but, but that's how you learn. So that's, that shouldn't be any secret, but it is kind of tough to uh, uh, just drop in and say, hey, I've got this thing, and it's big, and I want it done, and you've never even really done a code review. So you, it, it makes it kind of hard to get, get people to pay attention to your stuff if, if you're not paying attention to theirs. And anybody can review? Anybody can review. You, you, there's, a, there's a 
an onboarding process where you sign the agreement saying you're going to be a good citizen, you, you, you load your keys up, but anybody can review anything as much or as little as you want. You can review any project, any time, just as long as you go through that onboard process, which you know takes 30 minutes or whatever, and you're set. Respond with you uh, as soon as you can. So when you submit a patch uh, and you got some concern or some comments in general, try to get back. Uh, and it, it's true even the other way around. So if you are doing review, please try to babysitting a review from the beginning to the end. Don't just leave a comment and then disappear. All these things help to keep the communication going on. And again, we notice that if the communication can uh, go well, this helps in get your stuff merged uh, sooner. So one thing that was labeled as annoying um, is people doing kind of bullying or nagging to, to get things reviewed. We see a lot of this in Cinder because we've got about eight, 70 drivers uh, for storage arrays in the tree, and there's always new people coming on board bec because their company wants to get a driver into Cinder. Well, a driver's two or 3,000 lines of code. Um, it's usually somebody who's, you know, the first time your driver is, you're new to the community. Um, and we have a deadline for it, usually the second milestone. And so as the deadline approaches, everybody's on there saying, please review my patch, please review my patch. And, you know, there's only so many two, 3,000 line patches you can review. Uh, so uh, the secret is don't wait until the second milestone to start nagging people about your patch. And don't wait to start asking questions in IRC and, and don't wait to start getting involved in the project. I mean, if you just have 10 lines, some simple patch, it's not that big a deal, but you know if, you're, if you have a major feature or even more importantly, something like a driver, um, it's just not gonna happen that you can kind of nag people into getting it done. And I've seen several blow ups where it's like, stop bugging me about this from the PTL, you know, we'll look at it when we look at it. One of the things that can help in uh, speed up the review process is the co-authoring. Uh, maybe you know you can work, uh, more than one people can work on uh, a single patch. Uh, this works very well, especially if the other author is in a different time zone, because again, that reduces uh, the round trip of, uh, uh, or the discussion uh, addressing concerns. But we want uh, to give you an advice. Be sure that you are absolutely on the same page. Be sure that you both know what you want to implement, how you want to do it. Uh, otherwise, the risk is the co-authoring just instead of giving you a gain, just give you more pain. Yeah, and so um, one thing about co-authoring is you have to be prepared to jump in if your partner is not responding to reviews or if somebody says, you know, here's, here's a bug. I mean, you've got you to change the code. You need to be ready to jump in, put the patch up, and, and get it up there because especially if you're working for different com companies or you know the lines of communication aren't great because you're on the other side of the planet, um, it's kind of frustrating to see someone put something up there that needs addressing and you know the answer and you, you have the answer and your partner's not responding. So just jump right in. Uh, another thing about co-authoring is that we discovered as well, we kind of met while co-authoring a patch and um, you know, with the patch, and then when we finally decided to do this presentation, you know, we used IRC, we used um, GitHub to, to, to share the slides. We used Google Hangouts, and you know, we, we, we met this week. Um, we, didn't, we had never really met before. So you can do a lot of collaborating. Oop, we don't need Wi-Fi. Oh, what? I don't know what happened. Can you go to the next slide? <laughs> yeah, all right. That's a nit. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so, so this, this, this particular patch was kind of one of the things that set us off for this. Um, we were working on a spec with another, uh, another person uh, to get a feature into Nova, changing the API. It was fairly complex. Um, the spec kind of started in March. It uh, went through patch 53 patches um, from March, then on to April, lots of people paying attention, lots of core reviewers giving feedback, lots of work. Um, it went on into June, it went on into August, and then it got abandoned because at the end, you know, the, the, the core team said, we're not gonna go in this direction. Um, so this can happen. I mean, it was a lot of work. Um, if there's any good news at this conference, we kind of revisited some of the things, found another way to get it done, found general agreement at, at a session, there's still a lot of work to do, so it'll probably be 
two more releases before the, the work gets done. Um, but I guess be prepared for this because um, you know not only does it sometimes take a long time to get things done, but sometimes it takes a long time and, and you don't get things done. Um, and I don't know that there's any real way around it. Yeah. I just that is my comment. Start, I'm a bit lost here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so same thing comes back in advice. Um, simple things can take weeks, uh, and complex things can take, take months or multiple releases. So even if you know everything, if you know the process, if you know exactly the code that you are working on, remember, it's never easy to get something merged in AppStream. i give you an example. So it's something that happened to me a uh, couple of years ago. I thought I found uh, a typo. So an easy fix, uh, as you can see, was a single line code change. More precisely, I changed this field from update to updated. I say, okay, good. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and that's the result <laughs> of my patch. And uh, yeah, some numbers. It took me eight patches, 13 modified files, five weeks, and definitely not just a single line change, yes, but got merged. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, uh, I guess that's why we do reviews, right? We think, well, this is just a one character change, so it's going to be simple. But during the review process, things were found. So that's, that's yet another thing to think about is what you might be used to doing inside your company. And like, I can get this done. I'll have my peers review it, and then it'll be merged. And then tomorrow, I'll start something new. Um, things are much slower upstream. Yes, you need to keep in mind, uh, <clears throat> especially if uh, your company asks something, uh, we want everything now and for free, and you say, okay, I can do it, and you make some promise uh, to your boss. Uh, but remember that the timing of the community is, could be very different from the timing of your uh, company. So you need to set expectation very well. Uh, otherwise, you can end up like these guys, this is the review meeting, you are that one in front of the boss. You say, sorry, it didn't land. Uh, we need to wait the next cycle. So maybe we'll have it in three months' time. So yeah, be aware of this. Yeah. If so the, uh, another bit of advice about major features taking a long time. If you've showed up at the design summit here with an idea, it's not going to get into Mitaka probably. So that's just sort of one of the things uh, that came back from, from advice is, you can you can start it on specs early. You can you can write POC code. The more prepared you are, the more likely things things will get done. Um, I had a simple requirement from from my employer, Cinder Cinder Value Manager. is It's not possible to deploy it in an active active configuration. We we just needed to do a couple things to get it get it out of there. But as we delved into it, we discovered more and more things that needed doing, and more and more features that needed doing ahead of time. So, uh, you know, it's just yet another thing where what would have been simple ha if we did it ourselves upstream is going to going to take a couple of release cycles. Um, but I was able to, you know, come at it prepared. I had some POC code and uh, a spec ready a month ago. Uh, I was asked by the PTL, hey, will you have this stuff ready at the at the summit? I said, well, it's already ready now. And everybody's like, oh, what a, what a surprise. Somebody didn't wait to the last minute to do it. So you, so it behooves you to, to be proactive on these things. Yes, Nova did a very good thing in this uh, cycle. Uh, they decided to open the submission and the review uh, for the specs for the M release uh, in Liberty. Uh, so the idea was submit, we start the review process, uh, and uh, if we get uh, something we need to discuss in more detail, we just come to the summit and we can discuss it. I think it worked uh, very well. Oh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> We asked this question in our survey. Uh, how much are you influenced by the author of a patch? Uh, not all, but most of the answer we got is uh, yes, I am. I am. And I was disappointed at the beginning because I thought uh, everyone should have exactly the same chances to get uh, attention from a review. Then thinking more about it, it's uh, just part of the human being, right? So if you know, if you have any kind of relation with a person, it's much easier to get in touch with this person. Uh, you can disagree uh, with these things, nothing you can do. It's uh, how it works uh, in the upstream at the moment, yeah. Oh, 
Well, that's it. that's that's right, and that's why it works, and, that, and that's what people said. You know that that they they know a, a re, they know a person submitting a patch has a certain expertise, or if they don't know them, then they have to scrutinize it more. So that's why they pay more or less attention to to things that are known. Um, but you can get build your own reputation by doing things and and, and paying attention in IRC and um, you know chiming in there, and then people recognize your name, and then when you submit a patch, they recognize your name. So. It's it, it as Andrea said. It's a human thing. You you have you have a reputation, and you have to cultivate it. Yeah. So build your reputation. Don't be shy. Go out. No, no. At the end of the talk, <laughs> make connection. It is a really good uh, opportunity uh, that you, you are here at the summit to meet new people. And so, so this is my favorite picture. So I insisted that we put it in there. It's the Tower of Babel. It's uh, from a 15th century painter. Um, which kind of reminds me of OpenStack. You know, the story of the Tower of Babel was they were going to build a, a tower that would reach the sky, and uh, they had to get more and more people working on it. And then the people were all speaking different languages, and they couldn't communicate, and they never built the tower. But we're hopeful that OpenStack will continue to grow, and yet at the same time, we can keep the communication going. And so I stuck the slide in. We have a little thank you for our, our people we got the images from. And now and Scott is taking all your questions. Yeah, if anybody has any <laughs> questions, we've got a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you had to put in your first blueprint and your specs. What route did you take to figure out how to do it? I, reading other blueprints and specs and reviewing um, specs, because you can see what kind of things people look for. But you know, you can go into the Cinder Specs, Nova Specs, or one of these repositories and read the specs from, you know, just read a couple specs, especially if you're changing the API, find a spec that changed the API and, and, and see what kind of things were addressed. And then you'll you'll at least have some examples. Just like when you rip off someone's code, you can you can kind of steal from someone's cool. specs. And, okay. and and Faye, just put specs, be prepared to get a minus one. Don't <laughs> take it personally and yeah, yeah. iterate on it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Sure. How patient should you be uh, when waiting for uh, a simple review to get merged? That's a tough. That's a tough call because you don't want to nag. But you know, right. if you don't do anything, you know, it gets starved out because there's no algorithm to prevent starvation of reviews, right? Um, so I think one of the things that helps is know the process. You know, some like Nova has a real specific way to look through bugs, yeah. and 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 they they tend to do a pretty good job. Where Cinder doesn't really have a way. Um, so it's a tough one. I, I, I don't know that there's a hard answer there. I think in IRC, you could, you know, you got to find a, a, a buddy. You got to find someone who, who participates a lot and maybe is a core, maybe not. And you got to sort of say, hey, any, can you have a look at this? Or, or even get people you know who aren't cores or whatever to, to review it and, you know, say, hey, this has five plus ones. Can someone have a look at this? So it's okay to, 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 to poke and prod a little bit. I mean, you know, obviously things do get forgotten. Yes, I think you need three things: patience, patience, and patience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, no, but, actually, but you're gonna the, have to you're gonna have to do something besides just wait forever. In the Nova, if you go, for example, for Nova uh, in IRC during the Nova meeting, you can ask for review and you just say, okay, we'll have a look. Yeah, something that's probably worth being aware of with that kind of thing is that um, the the projects, uh, the PTLs, do generate lists of patches and how old they are and how long a patch has been hanging around without being reviewed. So if you've been there for a very long time, you will pop out on somebody's spreadsheet as being, this one hasn't been looked at. Um, I don't know if all projects do that, but they do that. Yeah, in, in, in Cinder, there's a dashboard that the PTL says, use this dashboard, and it, it lists things that need more review, things that haven't had a review in five days. Whether or not people use the dashboard, that's a little tough. So you gotta, you, you, there's a balance there. Other, other questions? Yeah. I have like five questions, but I didn't want to hog the uh, microphone. That's okay. I'll, we'll I'll just, open I'll it up between your questions. <laughs> and we are here later. Um, so uh, I guess my next most important one uh, would probably be uh, when when you're changing some code that doesn't have existing tests. Um, so the, the, this question is from two sides. Like one is when you're the developer. Uh, should you just assume that you need to write the tests first even I mean I know generally that's obviously the case but like I'm talking about a situation where there's like a whole framework missing in that area and it would be like a massive amount like another project in itself to uh, to, to to add the tests and from the maintainer side because I'm in this situation that I've just um, 
uh, started up this new project, but it's inherited a code base from somewhere else. And uh, at the moment, I'm the only maintainer, which is not ideal. But um, you know, I want to change stuff, and I want to add a test suite. Um, and now I'm faced with the decision: should I, you know, spend a huge amount of effort uh, writing the, a test suite from scratch uh, before I change anything, or is it okay for me to start changing stuff in the it's first place? I think it depends on the project. Yeah, I, the the example uh, we put about my pets is for a single uh, line change. Actually. Basically, they because of this problem, they found that we are not testing for that bit of code. So they asked me, yeah, so if you want to fix it, just write tests. So I think, yeah, you have to write tests. And that guy who say, yes, he's a code reviewer. He's not a bad guy. So <laughs> you, you need more resources is what you need. You need, you need. Yeah. And it is a way to get involved and, and endear yourself to the community. People love tests, but they don't love to write them, right? And don't have time for it. So the more you can contribute on the testing end, the more of a hero you'll be. So it's, you know. I think we are out of time. So free acts now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>